Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to be back on campus virtually as we start a new year. We're very blessed to begin a new year in spite of all of the turmoil which surrounds us because we stand on the promise of faith, a faith that has carried us and our institution for over 150 years. Our founders, those associated with our university can certainly instruct us on challenging times like those we face today. So girded with this faith, we stand tall and we use that faith to carry us through every situation which we can face because we know that we are blessed and we are surrounded and fortified by a God who has promised he will never leave us nor forsake us. I am so pleased this morning to introduce a friend, colleague, and one of Morgan's most stellar professors, Professor Dale Glenwood Green. Professor Green is intimately and intricately linked to Morgan through his grandparents. And um, Professor Green is linked to one of our founders, the great founder, Samuel Green. He will bring us this morning a most inspiring discussion about the legacy of our chapel and the legacy of the chapel's history in the history of Morgan State University. Without uh, further ado, I'd like to present to you Professor Dale Glenwood Green. We welcome you this morning, Professor Green, and thank you for blessing us with your insightful knowledge uh, during this discussion, which we call Insightful Foundations. Uh, thank you, Mr. Howes, for that great introduction. He's a dear friend and a great and esteemed Morgan alumni class of 1967, and is the chairman of our Friends of the Chapel for Morgan State University's Memorial Chapel. And so again, I do thank you for that. Uh, I wanna recognize also Dean of the Chapel, uh, Reverend Dr. Barnard Kills, uh, and I see Mrs. Marsha Price is here, and uh, Reverend Clarence Wayman, who's also my uncle, and many others that have joined with us. Uh, it is a joy to uh, be back in the space while virtually here with everyone uh, and to be able to uplift during times like these uh, the history and the evolution of the chapel during this insightful foundation session. Uh, so I'm very honored to lead this discussion uh, as a Morgan professor and certainly as a Morgan alum and as a descendant of one of our uh, esteemed founders of Morgan State University. Uh, so I greet you all this morning uh, in that manner. Uh, I have several uh, slides visually that I will be able to share with everyone that has joined and those that will be able to uh, share in with us later around this uh, remarkable history and significant legacy of Morgan State University. And of course, through the lens um, of the uh, Morgan State University Chapel. Uh, I have elected to uplift a African proverb uh, to begin our uh, discussion on the history and the evolution of the chapel. And I have often referenced uh, this African proverb, but it is very fitting uh, within the context of looking at the Morgan State University Memorial Chapel and also understanding the significance of African Americans uh, and our race and our course as it has related to activism uh, and social justice. And so certainly for all of those that have seen <clears throat> activities that they have occurred on yesterday, if you will, it is certainly important to understand our history and our role and our contribution uh, as African-Americans. And so this African proverb 
reads, when you pray, move with your feet. And our ancestors and our people and our students at Morgan State University, past and present, I believe have certainly been guided by this uh, very important African proverb that when you pray, move with your feet. And it is this spirit of black activism uh, that is laced all throughout the Morgan State University history uh, and legacy. Uh, I use similarly in this virtual space, another very <laughs> important hashtag uh, for us to be mindful of during this time. And that is hashtag Morgan has always mattered. Uh, Morgan has played a tremendous role uh, in our nation uh, and also in our world. Uh, in terms of uh, preparing, uh, but also in terms of uh, being an active participant uh, in the uh, activities of advancing uh, the African Americans experience, not only here in America, but across the globe. Uh, our founding raison d'etre uh, was centered on moral and intellectual elevation as the early African-American founders of Morgan State University, then the Centenary Biblical Institute uh, created the founding mission of our institution out of the black church. So while we'll highlight the chapel as we refer to it today, it's very important to understand as we get started that this is about the black church. Uh, and this is about understanding the role of the black church and how it has been at the centrality of the African-American experience. And certainly that is not removed uh, from the historically black college and university experience that we know of as Morgan State University. Um, we are also very proud uh, to be able to wear uh, the banner and have a very distinct um, uh, designation within uh, the nation of Morgan being a national treasure, the only university and college in America uh, whose entire campus is designated as such, uh, a national treasure designated by the National Trust uh, for Historic Preservation uh, in 2016. And we'll look at that a little bit more as we go forward. Um, you heard me reference the Black Church. Uh, you certainly heard me reference how the Black Church has been uh, at the centrality of the African-American experience uh, and certainly the HBCU experience. And it's important to understand as we look at this through the lens of many slides uh, that these race men as they would have been referred to or women um, are very important to the context of understanding the history of Morgan and the evolution of the chapel. It's important to understand that a race man or a race woman is a loyal member of the black race who dedicates their life uh, to directly contributing to the betterment of black people. And these are the founders, these are the professors, these are the students, these are the alumni, these are all of those that had their hands, if you will, in the formation and the continuation of a Morgan State University. And these are very much the individuals who were at the helm of the black church, at the helm even today of what we refer to as the Morgan State University Memorial Chapel. And so it's important to understand what it means when you hear that old 19th century statement of yours for the race, because these race men and these race women are integral to uh, the continuation and the advancement of our society. Uh, as Mr. Howes mentioned in my introduction, uh, or rather in introducing me, uh, that my ancestry is intertwined uh, with the history and the legacy of Morgan State University. Uh, I thought it would be appropriate here to share uh, not only my own legacy, but certainly that of Reverend Clarence Wayman, who's joined here with me. As I mentioned, he's my uncle, my mother's brother, uh, and uh, affiliated with Morgan and certainly connected with our Morgan uh, Chapel. Uh, but I'm showing here my maternal history, which is where Reverend Clarence Wayman uh, comes in, and then my paternal history, uh, which is where Reverend Samuel Green Sr., uh, one of our African-American founders of Morgan State University, uh, comes in. But on both sides of my uh, family's history, uh, I have two race men 
uh, who I am able to be guided by and inspired by and certainly are uh, intertwined with the history of Morgan State University and HBCUs across the country. Um, you'll also see at the top of the slide, coincidentally, how marriages and also bloodlines uh, have tied me then to two other very significant race men and race women in our global history. Uh, on my maternal uh, history side, uh, Frederick Douglass, as we know him today, but when he was born in 1818, he was born Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey and later took up the name Douglas. And it is the Bailey and the Wayman family that intermarried in the early 1800s on the Eastern shore where my uncle and I are from in Caroline County along the Tuckahoe River. And the Bailey and Wayman families uh, had in their initial marriage, more than 12 children born from that marriage. But I'm not gonna give a genealogical history today. This is just more to give you a backdrop of where all of this is coming from. But nevertheless, that's how we uh, end up being intertwined with the Frederick Douglass history. And of course, he has a history as well uh, with Morgan State University, Frederick Douglass, which you will see and I'll walk you through uh, today. And then on the Harriet Tubman side, uh, di different on the Harriet Tubman side, uh, Harriet Tubman is a blood relative. Her mother, Harriet Ritt Green, was a sister to Reverend Samuel Green Sr.'s father, who was James Green. And so in short, because all of that history is somewhat complicated as you go back multiple generations, when you hear about Harriet Tubman and her grandmother, uh, whose name was Modesty Green. And Harriet Tubman spoke often about her grandmother being a great guide to her. Well, her grandmother is my eighth great grandmother. And she is the one that was brought here from Africa, from Ghana, Africa to Dorchester County on Maryland's Eastern shore. And her two children, James Green and Harriet Ritt Green gave rise to a Harriet Tubman as we know her today and Reverend Samuel Green Sr., our founder of Morgan State University. And so I share all of that in short, really to help us understand that these are the race men and race women who are connected to our own families, but also were those that were at work bettering our overall communities. These are individuals that are known globally, some known nationally, and some known locally. They're your relatives, they're my relatives. These are everyday people, if you will. But they understood evangelism as a zealous advocacy of a cause. And they worked very diligently as race men and race women. And it resulted in many institutions like a Morgan State University um, founded in 1867. At the same time, uh, just to show you how our families were at work, and I say ours because I encourage students and others to always examine you know, uh, the history and the legacy of institutions that we're affiliated with, uh, juxtapose your own personal family experiences because you will find uh, that your ancestors were also at work at these very important causes as you learn your history. Uh, a dear colleague, uh, professor, at Harvard University, uh, Dr. Henry Louis Gates always says, wherever you go in history, you will find that there were black people who were making contributions, but their contributions have been lost, buried and obscured. And so that's why I say it's very important for us to understand our history and to research our history because you will find that there were black people in your family who were making contributions, but they may have been lost, buried, and obscured. And so even during the same year that Morgan State University was being founded in 1867 as the Centenary Biblical Institute, I'm sharing uh, Reverend Wayman and I's ancestor, Bishop Alexander Wayman, whom with his brother, Reverend Charles Henry Wayman, were founding a local school in uh, Maryland's Eastern Shore, right in Denton, Maryland. Uh, which was called the Denton Colored School. And coincidentally, my grandfather, Reverend Wayman's father, uh, was a student at that school and is pictured in this May 1925 uh, photograph here, along with many other Waymans uh, in that picture. And so Bishop Wayman went on to be a founding trustee of the Wilberforce University 
an HBCU from 1856. And so these are the types of things that they were doing in the 1800s. Uh, Reverend Samuel Green Sr., along with four of his African-American clergy uh, men, Reverend James Harper, Reverend Elijah Grissom, Reverend James Peck, Reverend Benjamin Brown, and Reverend Samuel Green Sr., my sixth great-grandfather, were the five African-American visionary founders uh, who put their hands to what Langston Hughes referred to as freedom's plow and began to go to work at establishing a school, a centenary biblical institute that would then become what we call today Morgan State University. This is a historic photograph of the very church, which is called Sharp Street Church, the Sharp Street Methodist, then Episcopal Church, now Sharp Street United Methodist Church. Uh, it was this very site where Reverend Samuel Green Sr. and the other African-American clergymen assembled to form a committee on religious education that would initiate the founding mission of our Morgan State University's institution centered on the moral and intellectual elevation. Uh, and they convened in 1864 in the basement of this church, uh, which no longer exists. The building has uh, been demolished. But it is very important to understand, as I repeat, that the Black church, and I know many are uh, fearful and also too politically correct at times uh, to not reference and give proper credit to the role and the legacy and the history of the African-American church. But simply put, we cannot tell the history of Morgan State University without talking about the role of the African-American church. And so as we understand the sequence of our history, we'll get to a word like the chapel and we'll get to a place like the chapel. But as I start, I have to talk about the church. Uh, we were born out of the Sharp Street Church. As you've just seen, the founders met literally and physically in Sharp Street's church. And later you'll see that the initial classes for Morgan were held and convened in the basement of the church. But first I want us to understand just how important the black church is and was to our overall experience. Uh, this is a historical illustration of the watch night service. So as we've just now greeted each other as we've come on with a happy new year and we are just you know in now the um, early part of our year on the seventh day of uh, 2021, uh, many of you have, may have participated in a 2020 watch night service uh, held virtually mostly this year uh, but these watch night services, uh, worship services, uh, as we know them most today, born out of the African American experience and certainly the church experience. Uh, December 31st was a important date in the black experience, historically, even prior to the term watch night service uh, surfacing. Um, early in the antebellum history on December 31st would be the eve upon which African Americans would have historically looked out in great fear of what would happen on January 1, which was typically the day that African and African Americans would be taken to the slave auction blocks to be sold on January 1st. And most families feared how divided they would become each year as a result of the major day, January 1st, when most African and African Americans would be sold throughout many parts of this country. And that was historically the eve and the, the importance and significance of a January 1st. It later then became a very important and significant date in our black experience and black church experience on December 31st, 1862, becoming known then as the watch night service in the black church, because unlike those previous December 31st and those previous January 1st, it was President Abraham Lincoln, 
who had authored a emancipation proclamation that would go into effect on January 1st, 1863. And so on this December 31st, 1862, Black folks like us looked out, watched out that night in great anticipation that on January 1st, 1863, we would be a free people by way of the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, again, this isn't um, a scholarly history lesson because there's a lot around the Emancipation Proclamation that we can't quite go into because not every African and African-American would have been freed by this Emancipation Proclamation. And later in the case of the state of Maryland, we would have to sign a Maryland Emancipation Proclamation with free people in Maryland, November 1st, 1864. But nevertheless, this 1862 date of December 31st, and in the Black church experience, the watch night services became a very important and memorable experience. And there are so many different ceremonies and services that we <clears throat> continue to celebrate within the context of the church and i.e. the chapel. Um, marking our sesquicentennial year, 2017, 150 years, uh, many members like Mr. Howells and Dr. Bernie Hollis and Dr. Edwin Johnson and many others uh, were able to assemble to really do a greater level of justice on our early African-American clergymen and founders who were at the helm of uh, starting our institution. And we had a major tribute ceremony uh, held at our chapel on campus in recognition and in honor of the late Reverend Samuel Green Sr., um, whom we were able to uh, begin a full history on. And unfortunately, he is our only African-American founder of the five that we have more than one image of and even a image of, period. Uh, which is very unfortunate, uh, but we were able to commemorate his life and his legacy uh, along with those of his clergymen. Uh, he was a freedman and a Methodist preacher, an underground railroad conductor, along with his colleagues and a visionary founder of Morgan State uh, University. We were also able to go back, quote unquote, home to the Sharp Street Church and celebrate our spiritual heritage and foundation. Uh, and we use the theme, thou who has brought us thus far on the way. And it was important for us to bring our entire Morgan family together and to center this worship experience around our sesquicentennial by uplifting all of the spiritual heritage uh, and foundation as it related to this. And it's very important, and I'll go very quickly highlighting uh, what leads us to the history of the institution and then of the chapel as it relates to the experience of the church. Our particular institution, a historically black college and university, Morgan State University, was birthed out of the Sharp Street uh, Methodist Church. And Sharp Street, in a sense, was birthed out of the Lovely Lane Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, one of the earliest uh, Methodist churches in America uh, here in Baltimore, 1784, which was originally located in this building and on East Redwood Street. Uh, currently, there is a Lovely Lane, uh, the second Lovely Lane Church, which is the, uh, the most uh, present and historic of the Lovely Lane, uh, is their second church structure, and that was the original. Uh, we uplifted individuals, as I said, the race men and women who were central early preceding our founders uh, who laid the groundwork for a Morgan State University, like a uh, Reverend Harry Hosier, who was the first uh, Black Methodist preacher uh, from 1750 to 1806. Uh, early free Blacks in Baltimore, like Caleb Highland and Jacob Forty, who were the founders of the Colored Methodist Society, which then goes on to give rise to the Sharp Street Methodist Church as the Black Church. And again, these were race men and also activists because they protested and demonstrated against the white church, which essentially excluded them from full participation in the church. So our early activist role and agenda is born out of 
church. Sharp Street, its first church structure and the creation of Sharp Street uh, in particular by 1802 at this site uh, is uh, this particular building and it preceded the second building where our institution as Morgan State University uh, becomes physically uh, intertwined. Uh, this building um, by 1860 occupied the site and by 1864, our founders were meeting and convening at this site, preparing for a formal 1867 uh, establishment of Morgan State University. Today, the Sharp Street Church, uh, its 1898 structure is located in West Baltimore, which is where we held the actual ceremony. Frederick Douglass, who I had mentioned earlier, Frederick Douglass was a member of Sharp Street Church in Baltimore uh, during his times when he was enslaved in Baltimore in 1836 uh, to the 1838 time period when he was escaping from Baltimore as a slave. Our Morgan journey is a very unique and important journey uh, that is tied to uh, these early African-American founders uh, who were activists and racemen. And it is also tied to uh, the experience associated with our Maryland Emancipation uh, Proclamation. Um, October 31st, 1864 was the eve of Maryland's Emancipation Proclamation. What is important about that is our founders convened on the three days and they convened for three days and in particular, the three days uh, prior to the signing of Maryland's Emancipation Proclamation, because they wanted, when November 1st, 1864 came, they wanted to ensure that there were full plans for a institution that would train African-Americans and it would become uh, the first African-American uh, college that would train African-Americans in Maryland. So while Bowie had a earlier date than Morgan in terms of uh, our 1867 date and Bowie having an 1865 date and so forth, uh, it was Morgan that actually became uh, a college uh, prior to uh, Bowie becoming a college and university. Um, there are several important dates to understand within the context of uh, Morgan's experience as well. Uh, Morgan, uh, Morgan's white Methodist leaders met on December 25th, 1866, uh, after they had received petitions from its black uh, founders of the institution uh, to further formalize the institution. On April 30th, which is why we celebrate I Love Morgan uh, week during that time frame, uh, the first class was convened in the basement of Sharp Street on April 30th, 1867. And then on November 27th, which is when our Founders Day Convocation coalesce every year, that marks our official founding of Morgan State University, uh, the Articles of Incorporation. <clears throat> uh, and so we were the Centenary Biblical Institute from 1867 to 1890, when again, we became the first college in Maryland, um, college and university to train African-Americans and we were re-Christianed as Morgan College in honor of Reverend Littleton Morgan, uh, who was a, a white Methodist uh, minister and an abolitionist and uh, was one of Morgan's largest philanthropists uh, at that time, gave what would be the equivalent of $2.5 million uh, in 1890 uh, to the institution and we became a four-year college. And then in 1939, we were sold uh, as a private college. Uh, we, we were sold to the state of Maryland to become a public institution and we became Morgan State College. And then in 1975, we were elevated uh, to the university status. Um, and so those dates are significant in our overall Morgan journey. So again, uh, previous sites of the institution were tied to the Sharp Street Church. Uh, we then were able to acquire our own uh, first building, uh, which would have been in the area of the Mercy Hospital. And then our third site, which is one that's more common, is a site where Reverend John Goucher 
um, a white uh, minister as well, and on our board, and also the founder of Goucher College, uh, conveyed the property at Old West Baltimore at Fulton and Evanston. Uh, and then uh, from there, the institution created additional institutions that it's important to understand was done in concert with the African American church. And so we formed a branch institution on Maryland's Eastern Shore uh, called the Princess Anne Academy, also called at one point the Delaware Conference Academy. It then became the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, but it was an institution that was birthed in partnership with the Black Methodist Church on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. The Metropolitan Methodist Episcopal Church in particular uh, which is there in Princess Anne, Maryland. And many of the black leaders there on Maryland's Eastern Shore, like Reverend Joseph Waters, who was the pastor of Methodist Episcopal Church uh, in Metropolitan in 1886, who worked with our leaders to form that institution. And then we trained many of the leaders who went on to become the president of what we call UMES today, like Reverend Benjamin Byrd, who was a Morgan graduate, graduated from the Centenary Biblical Institute and then became the leader of the Princess Anne Academy. The, the very notable Reverend Dr. Charles A. Tendley, who was a founding member of the Delaware Conference of the Methodist Church, which was the Black Conference, uh, was um, intertwined with this history. And he went on to become one of the earliest uh, Black preachers to have a mega church, uh, had nearly 5,000 members during his time. Uh, Dr. Uh, Reverend Prezavi O'Connell, where we have O'Connell Hall on our campus today. Uh, not only was he clergy, but he was one of our earliest professors of history uh, in Morgan. Uh, Reverend Thomas Kaya, who was also uh, a president of the Princess Anne Academy, now in UMES, uh, but was one of the leading activists who was involved um, in calming the climate, if you will, after one of the last major lynchings happened in Maryland and on the Eastern shore of Maryland. He was one of the uh, lead race men, if you will, who was unafraid, if you will, to step forward and really be a leading voice and champion in uh, getting everyone uh, calmed and returning to a state of normalcy. This is Reverend Littleton Morgan, uh, who is the uh, namesake of our institution and one of our former uh, trustees and chairman of the board uh, and uh, was the philanthropist who donated the $2.5 million uh, to the institution. As a result, they re-Christianed the institution as Morgan College. And then Morgan sp spread its tentacles even further through the lens of these, uh, the, the black church and through the support of the uh, respective clergy and forming the Morgan um, Virginia Collegiate and Industrial Institute in Lynchburg, Virginia. And this is in 1891. And at the helm of that was the Jackson Street Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, which is still there uh, from 1866. And it was that church uh, that worked with, again, our early leaders uh, and formed that institute uh, and such leaders like Professor and Reverend Frank Trigg, uh, who uh, led the uh, Virginia Collegiate Industrial <clears throat> uh, for a long period. And then even as we come to the campus that everyone knows now, which is our current and present campus at Cold Spring in Hillen, where we have had the lion's share of our history as a Morgan College, Morgan State College, and now Morgan State University. This very campus and the hollow grounds of this original campus has been intertwined with this history and commemorates this history. Early on, one of the early buildings on the campus, Washington Hall, was named in honor of the Washington Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church, which was the Black Conference. Uh, we do still hold that name Washington on campus today. You would have heard it referred to the Washington Service Center. So while this building no longer exists, the name Washington, which is not for President George Washington, but is in honor of the Washington Conference, the Black Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church. And our early and first building that we constructed, the Andrew Carnegie Hall building of 1919, is the very building that brought us, in a sense, 
uh, to the present site. Uh, Andrew Carnegie's gift had a condition that we build a building, name it in his honor, and we also were required to locate uh, conducive property uh, to form the, the new campus. The first home built in the neighboring development that Morgan created named Morgan Park that abuts Morgan. Uh, the first member to lead in putting a house in that community when Morgan endured great racial upheaval as we've been seeing in modern day and developing the land that we now know as Morgan State University. It was Reverend Dr. Pazavio O'Connell who was the first to build a home, sending a signal in that community. And this home still stands in that community. He was the adopted father of Ma Roberts, uh, who you, um, Helen Roberts rather, Ma Helen Roberts. And many of you like myself have dined in the Helen Roberts facility on campus. All of these individuals are connected and intertwined uh, with this history. The Bellevue and Morton Estate Acquisition, which is the site where our present day library stands, the Hurt Gym, uh, the new Tyler building, uh, the Cummings and the Baldwin Hall um, uh, location. These sites, uh, along with our Hughes Stadium, these sites where we commemorate individuals like our alum and, and early black clergymen like Bishop William Alfred Carroll Hughes, who has a rather long name that many of you know as the W.A.C. Hughes Stadium at Morgan, uh, which has been there since 1937, is named in honor of one of our alum and one of the early black bishops of the Methodist Episcopal Church and an early pastor of Sharp Street Methodist Church where we came out of uh, from 1905 when he pastored until 1912. Um, to the chapel, um, the grounds of the chapel, Coincidentally, the grounds of the chapel are very hollow. They were owned by an African-American when all of the property in that area <clears throat> was historically under white control. Uh, certainly African-Americans were, um, you know, sort of discouraged from even uh, being, uh, sort of being able to live and also legally, you know, not able to live in the area. Um, the land of, with the chapel was owned by Reverend M.J. Naylor, uh, which uh, was a property acquisition that was tied to our history um, and our institution being bought by the state of Maryland in 1939. And I'll speak to that more importantly as we look at the slides um, associated with that because that history was very unique and very important. And so our chapel is actually at the centrality of our Morgan's experience shifting from a private institution to a public institution, because we were private from 1867 to 1939, when the state of Maryland purchased Morgan and we became the Morgan State College. And with that purchase, it was the land that the chapel is situated on that was bought, a endowment that was established and funds that were used to hire an architect and to build a building. That is what happened with the proceeds from those funds. And I think it's very important for us to understand how the institution used those funds when we transition from private to public. And, and the chapel is our tangible symbol of that transition and remains still at the centrality of our HBCU experience. This is Reverend Dr. McHenry Jeremiah Naylor, who was referred to often as Reverend MJ Naylor. He was a Sharp Street Methodist preacher from 1912 to 1921, and he owned the land uh, for where the chapel's grounds are situated. And up until 2008, uh, that land was still, uh, for the most part, separated from the university proper. Uh, and is now very much a part of the uh, Morgan State University's um, acreage, uh, if you will. The chapel was a central part of the planning of Morgan State University's campus, in addition to Holmes Hall. And Holmes Hall, which is our iconic emblem, if you will, uh, of the institution is named in honor of our first black president, Reverend, uh, rather uh, President uh, Dwight Oliver Wendell Holmes, whose father was Reverend John Holmes and was pastor at Sharp Street Methodist Church. 
And so there were all these different connections between, again, our presidential leaders with the leaders in the black church and how that again began to shape literally and physically uh, Morgan's institution. So of course, Dr. Holmes shaped our experience physically. And this is the picture of the model that you can see of the campus in terms of how it actually has been built out. And later they uh, you know, uh, named in uh, Holmes Hall in his honor and built the most iconic structures, so to speak, uh, in honor of his legacy. But it is Dr. Holmes, whose father, Reverend John A. Holmes, a pastor from Sharp Street United Methodist Church um, <clears throat> from 1880 to 1883, uh, who gives rise to our having uh, a first black president at Morgan uh, from 19, beginning in 1937. And it is Dr. Uh, Dwight Oliver Wendell Holmes, who prior to becoming a president at Morgan was actually a teacher at the historic Frederick Douglass High School. And it is there that he actually met the architect, Albert Irvin Cassell, who then would later be engaged by uh, President Dwight Oliver Ender Holmes to design our Morgan State University Memorial Chapel. And so there are all these little connections oh. and traces of how we know God works. Uh, but certainly all of this is laced in the history of our institution. And so when we look at Morgan State University and we look at its campus and its built environment, uh, and this is a view from 1967 when Morgan was celebrating its centennial at its 100th anniversary. Uh, most of what we know as Morgan State University had been built out. Of course, we can see further up North Campus where it's still vegetated and, and forested and that wasn't there in 1967. But as you can see, the work of these early leaders uh, had produced uh, the masses of our uh, Morgan State as we know it. <clears throat> Bishop Forstith, who was able to uh, um, preach at the uh, sesquicentennial worship service, uh, was the pastor during the centennial anniversary of Morgan State University in 1967 at Sharp Street. And so we were able to uh, bring back these connections uh, in 2017 and re-honor that legacy accordingly. The three horsemen, as they were often referred to in Morgan's history, Carter, Grant, and Wilson, where we have a building named in their honor. Uh, but James Carter, George Grant, Edward Wilson were important individuals in the history of Morgan. We're all uh, intertwined with the, the church and also the administration of the institution and the student led uh, civil rights activist agendas and what have you. Um, early graduates who also were intertwined with uh, the church and also this activism agenda. Uh, Ashby Hawkins, uh, early attorney and early graduate of Morgan State University and affiliated with uh, Sharp Street and uh, George W. F. McMechan, our first graduate of the institution um, who graduated from Morgan uh, and went on to Yale University. Our first female graduate, Susie Carr Love, um, in which the chapel's sanctuary is actually named in her honor. It is the Susie Carr Love Chapel, as it's called, or sanctuary. Uh, she graduated from the Centenary Biblical Institute in 1878, and she is the mother of Bishop Edgar Love, who uh, was a founder of the Omega Psi Phi fraternity, the Q's, and also a bishop uh, in the Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, this is her son there, Bishop Edgar Amos Love, uh, who also was an administrator, principal of the Morgan Academy. And it's through the Morgan Academy where we get a significant alum like Zora Neale Hurston, who uh, began at the Morgan Academy in 1918 and became one of the nation's most foremost anthropologists and authors. Um, our legendary, the late Reverend Dr. Howard L. Cornish, um, whose experience uh, began at Morgan from 1927 and went to 1976. Um, he uh, jointly was on the faculty as a professor of mathematics, and he directed what, what was then referred to as uh, the Morgan Christian Center. And many of us knew it as the Morgan Christian Center, and it was the Morgan Christian Center when we were students, and we'll sort of, when many of us were students, and we'll get to uh, how, again, that transition to the uh, chapel comes about. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Richard McKinney, 
and I'm old enough and young enough to have known many of these people personally. And I was able to have served as a student member on what was then called the Morgan Christian Center Board of Trustees. And Dr. Richard McKinney was a member, Dr. Roland McConnell, Dr. Richard Bascom, many of these giants who are no longer with us and many of the current students and even faculty may not know these individuals, but Dr. Richard McKinney, uh, McKinney rather, was a uh, preacher, uh, was one of the last presidents of an HBCU called Stower College uh, down in West Virginia. Uh, he established the Department of Religion and Philosophy at Morgan in 1951. Uh, you know, again, these were leaders who were past and, and even in our more recent history, uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, who uh, visited our campus and spoke at our commencement in 1958 and shared excerpts right there at the W.A.C. Hughes Stadium on I Have a Dream speech. Uh, one of our esteemed alumni from the class of 1965, the retired senior bishop and presiding prelate of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, Bishop John Richardson Bryant, um, an alum of Morgan State University. And then the history of Morgan's founding of the fraternity and sorority Alpha Nu Omega, incorporated in 1988 on the campus, legendary uh, songwriter and vocalist and producers uh, within the faith or gospel community, Anthony Brown, who was a student when I was a student at Morgan State University. He graduated in 2003 and I in 2005. The legendary Morgan Choir Director, Dr. Nathan Carter. And I'm always reminded of one of his, I believe, favorite songs, certainly one that was always uh, directed and played at Morgan when I was a student. And uh, we just, you know, during times like these, I'm always reminded of that song of, if I can help somebody as I travel along the way, then mercy, my mercy. living <laughs> shall not be in vain. Mm -hmm. And certainly we need to remember that in times like these. But our renowned Morgan Choir, which is birthed out of that rich spiritual legacy and underpinning of our African-American experience and the black church experience. These songs, when some even ask today, how is it that the Morgan Choir is able to sing these gospel songs? Why is it that they sing these gospel songs? This is a part of our spiritual foundation. You know, we are birthed out of the black church. The civil rights agenda, <clears throat> the chapel was at the centrality of this experience of students beginning in 1947 and all the way up past 1960s, um, sit-ins and protests and demonstrations. Uh, the chapel was one of the sort of headquarters, if you will, where both faculty and students would convene and set the agendas uh, for the civil rights legacy. And of course, today we own the Dr. Lily Carol Jackson House and Civil Rights Museum that chronicles a lot of this as well. But right on our own campus, the chapel is that museum. The chapel are the hollow grounds of the activities that occurred when the spite wall was going up all around Morgan. The chapel was at the centrality of that experience as well with Dr. Holmes, who was able to work with the white community and prevent that wall from being built in its fullness. But a remnant of that wall, you can see from the chapel, um, the many artifacts that still remain on the campus um, and associated with this experience. We have a Frederick Douglass statue and the first one erected to him in the uh, state of Maryland on our campus. Um, a bridge named in honor of Senator Verda Welcome, a graduate of Morgan and the senator who led the uh, legislation for our elevation. Uh, the bronze statues that uh, honor the African Americans who fought in the war. The Negro College mural, which is now in the Student Center from 1954, coinciding with the Brown versus Board, uh, uh, Board of Education case. The Susie Carr Love Chapel, uh, which to this this year, as of 2021, the chapel is celebrating eight decades, 80 years. This is the 80th anniversary this year of our beloved Morgan State University Memorial Chapel. Uh, the McMeckin Hall, uh, named in honor of our first African-American graduate. All of these things led to uh, the initiation and the uh, development of Morgan <clears throat> State University and our Morgan State University Memorial Chapel. Um, it is here where I think I will end 
Um, even though I have more that I could uh, show in slides when I've been watching the clock as well, and it's 11.50, and I want to end here uh, to be able to take questions and comments and uh, Reverend Keels, perhaps I may have to do a part two, believe it or not, because I did not get to the remaining parts of this, believe it or not. But nevertheless, I think this is a good part, a good place to pause uh, and um, begin to open for any questions uh, that we may have uh, from the floor. But again, I was excited to take this, I think, unique opportunity given where we are in our history. Uh, and uh, in the experience of uh, America, and then also as it relates to the 80th anniversary of the chapel, to share glimpses of the significance of the role and the legacy of our founding, of our many leaders, of our mission, and of our purpose. And so with that, I thank all of you for the invitation this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. I want to know, um, in addition to everything that you've said, and I'm sure you have much more to share with us, is there a connection with Charles Drew in Morgan State University? Yes, there is. Um, and I <clears throat> did not have his pictures in this slide. However, I do have a picture of uh, Dr. Charles Drew. Um, whom when he initially began his experiences with Morgan State University uh, was um, the coach for the basketball team, believe it or not. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> we have a photograph of him standing in front of Holmes Hall with a number of basketball students, including Talmadge Hill, um, for which we now have the Hill uh, uh, field house named in his honor. Um, yes. He's also an early founder of the MEAC and so forth. And so, yes, uh, Charles Drew uh, recounts his experiences with Morgan um, and also considers that to be among his greatest accomplishments, along with his advancements in the science of uh, blood plasma and uh, so forth. So that's a great question uh, to have asked and to be able to confirm uh, with the Morgan legacy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dale, for a wonderful presentation. I have a couple of questions. It's good to hear from you, Dr. Kirchner. Oh, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for sharing the link. It really was a great presentation. I'm hoping that we can circulate this around because it's a wealth of information, um, especially um, since um, ACSA, which is the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture, is seeking out so many surveys for um, the role of equity in architecture, that um, these kind of um, statements and presentations have to be shared and circulated through um, venues that are authenticated and that are truly seeking um, equity in all dimensions of architecture and urban design. And since you focused on architecture, I think it's very important for them to have access to this presentation. Um, I got the information about this um, very uh, like this morning and I shared it, but I don't see anyone from ACSA here. So they probably have not looked at the email yet. Um, that's one thing. Second, I, I was curious to know, is the Carnegie Hall the only building on campus which has a name designa designation through monetary assignment? Are there other campus buildings that have names designated to people who donated money? Yeah, so let me respond to that. <clears throat> so the Carnegie Hall building certainly is the first building that Morgan constructed on the campus. There were buildings that existed prior. And it is one of the ones, as you mentioned, that was um, connected to an actual uh, donation uh, that had um, conditions that required a building to be built and to be named. Uh, it also had the condition, as I alluded to, that required us to find a new site. 
because it couldn't be built at the previous campus. Um, in more recent times, uh, the Tyler Hall building, not in full, uh, but certainly the Tylers uh, gave a uh, $5 million donation, uh, which led to their name being affixed to the Tyler Hall building as we have it. Many of the other buildings um, that are on Morgan's campus are buildings that were named in honor of individuals. So the Harriet Tubman Hall in honor of Harriet Tubman, no gift from Harriet Tubman. I mentioned Carter Grant Wilson building, again, named in honor of those three horsemen. And so your question is, um, is a good one in light of uh, an era when many institutions, both traditionally white and also HBCUs, um, are taking um, donations um, in order to build buildings and, and or are being required to name uh, a building in honor of someone based on that financial gift. But our legacy at Morgan uh, is one that's twofold. It's one where um, the buildings are named in honor of various race men and race women. Uh, and it is also one where, because we had this come up before a question where we do not have uh, any buildings that are named in honor of those where we are likely to have to remove the names of those individuals from the buildings, because these are all <clears throat> buildings that have been named in honor of um, abolitionists, if you will, in the case of non-race men or women, um, and or were named in honor of uh, noteworthy and significant race men and women like Benjamin Banneker, even with Banneker Hall and so forth and what have you. So that, that question is very timely and it's very important to clarify that uh, within the lens of you know legacy and naming. And so thank you for that question. My second question, thank you for the answer. That's a very coherent answer. And I think um, um, something that needs to be recognized as we pursue naming of anything on campus. Um, my second question is related to the, the, the shift from calling the chapel from church to chapel. When did that occur? Yes. Yeah, so, and that's and the, the reasoning and the reasoning behind it. Sure, absolutely. And that's the part. And that's why I said I almost need to do a part two, because uh, I didn't get fully to that in those slides and so forth. But in short, and I can share even personally with you, because as I alluded to, when I was a student, which was from 2001 to 2005, it was the Morgan Christian Center. And I had the opportunity of being named to the board. I was the only student member of the Morgan Christian Center Board of Trustees. Um, and uh, the director of the Morgan Christian Center at that time was the late Reverend Dr. Richard T. Adams. And prior to him, it was Reverend Richard Bascom for those that will recall and things of that nature. And I bring that up because at that time, it was governed by the Morgan Christian Center Board of Trustees who were um, affiliated <clears throat> by and large with the Methodist Episcopal Church or the United Methodist Episcopal Church and more, you know, for, for recent and present history. And it was the church that was really appointing uh, the directors uh, of the Morgan Christian Center. And so there was a, uh, a physical, if you will, a distinction in the grounds, the building, and the sort of operations of what was then called the Morgan Christian Center. The chapel, the chapel, which was then the Christian Center, sat on a different parcel, which wow. included the parsonage where Reverend Cornish lived, and we called it the Cornish House. Uh, it also had uh, other names that went along with it, and that parcel was owned by the Morgan Christian Center Board of Trustees. And that land, which as we drive around the campus, looks like it has always been one part of Morgan State University physically in the campus, would, was literally sort of a carved out piece of the pie. And so there was a true separation of church and state in a sense, because all other property was state of Maryland, Morgan State University. And so in 2008, the Morgan Christian Center Board of Trustees sold, transferred, I should say, 
<clears throat> transferred the property, which included the parsonage, the Cornish house, the, cha uh, the chapel, as we call it today, to Morgan State University. And in that process, which is where coincidentally, Reverend uh, Bernard Keels, who's the, you know, the inaugural Dean of the chapel, uh, was hired in 2008. I joined the faculty officially in 2008. So all these things were going on at that time. And President Earl Richardson was the president at that time. Um, the uh, chapel, the Christian Center rather, became a formal part of the Morgan State University um, institution and its building and grounds. The name had changed uh, before uh, that transition, it was being referred to as the Morgan Interfaith Center uh, prior to uh, the collapse of the Morgan Christian Center. Uh, and then uh, when uh, Reverend Keels, uh, under his leadership and uh, during the time of President David Wilson's leadership, uh, more formal renaming of the institution uh, or rather the, the uh, Christian Center as the Morgan State University Memorial Chapel occurred. But again, through slides and other things, I would have shown it a little bit more sequential and you could see it a little more illustratively, if you will. But in short, that's how that transition came about. And it's a very good question because the friends of the chapel and many others often talk about this because today it's very challenging for those of us that consider ourselves a part of the Morgan family to even have dialogue about this because there are those that really separate um, the church from state in ways in, that aren't very helpful in understanding the history of Morgan State University wow. and the role of the chapel. And so you asking a question like that is really important. It's better for persons to ask the question and to get the answers when or to do the research and to draw the conclusions, then there to be a lot of you know skepticism and uh, debate and, and fear about the role of church and state when it doesn't exist. Um, and it's important to understand how inextricable the chapel has been, as you've seen in just the slides that I've shown, in the history and the legacy and the contributions of Morgan State University. And so, for many of us, it's very personal, you know, that we you know, protect and be a good steward of not only of the building, its bricks and its mortar and the grounds, but of the contributions that the chapel has made, it continues to make, it has a role and a relevancy still connected to our founding mission. When we talk about, you know, what even happened on yesterday, I mean, moral and intellectual elevation, still relevant today, as sad as it is. And so, you know, we have to do everything that we can to help raise the awareness and the appreciation of the Morgan State University Memorial Chapel. So again, you, you've come with some really great questions and this is being recorded, I should share, uh, and it will be made uh, available because I know you mentioned there are those that need to see this and hear this and so forth. And they'll have that opportunity even though they're not here with us live. Uh, and so I appreciate the direction that you're going in. And, and as a colleague, you always know which direction to go and your moral compass is always quite on. Amen. So, Amen. so Amen. Here's, here's the thing. I mean, I know Bernard Keeley is like my brother and you are like <laughs> my brother as well. And I think that I just saw this morning, um, the Office of Provost sent an email about mindfulness. And uh, I'm gonna join that meeting tomorrow and uh, really request that we don't have a course on mindfulness, that mindfulness needs to cut across all courses. Amen. And I really think that the chapel can be the anchor of mindfulness. Mm. Of it is in many ways, folk, um, a very important process for us to commit ourselves to. Um, what you've heard today is nothing short of the excellent contribution of God using um, academics to forge the sense of what we really need in America and the world in 2021. I was having some difficulty with my audio on my computer, but I think that um, Dr. Christian, one of the things that so intrigues me about being at Morgan is to understand the spiritual foundation is what got us here. Mm -hmm. And if we began to either neglect 
or keep it lost or buried, obscured, we may never get to where we ultimately need to be. Uh, knowledge is nothing without a purpose. Uh, language is nothing without an ability to communicate one with another across racial, ethnic, and historic timelines. Um, can you imagine the vision and the power of the founders back in the 1800s? My, my. To be able to lift this up. You know how blessed you are, Clarence and Dale, to have direct descendants to people who, who did this. And when you go around campus today, one of the things that's so important is not so much what we say, it's what we do. And I really feel that this is gonna be a year in which uh, these uh, insightful foundations will have an enormous impact. Uh, not only should we do a second uh, session of this, Professor Green, I think we need to expand it to two or three sessions because, and we need to use this video, this recording, as a way of making it mandatory, rather than a mindfulness class, be, be mindful of what the road we've come. 50,000 graduates ago, uh, when there wasn't the kind of um, wherewithal and the, the, the things that we have now, people began on a promise. And that promise has produced each of you on the screen. Each of you has a spiritual DNA that's taking you from wherever your place of birth is to this common point now. It's incumbent upon all of us if we're going to wake up in a time to hear that very famous thing of well done that we know where this journey takes us. And um, it's just an exciting, exciting day. Professor Green, you are you're just an enormous um, inspiration to me personally and to be someone who came to Morgan in the 21st century um, uh, and is contributing so much. Uh, like my grandmother used to say, let them lose. Let them use you, son. Let them use you. <laughs> Amen. That's right. Huh? Amen. All righty. Well, I want to be able to go to an appointment, but I want to thank everyone, and we will make sure this recording gets to everyone. Please expand the um, listening uh, link to friends that you know around the university, because each week, Insightful Foundation brings, I think, some very powerful expressions. Um, uh, that contribute to our our growth and our development. Um, so having to say that, we will be see you again next Thursday at 11 o'clock. We're gonna be talking about the interfaith dynamism on campus, why it's important to realize that just as we hear in that title, University of Moral Chapel, we can realize that there are many faith groups on campus, all of which contribute mightily to the presence of what it means, uh, our Muslim community, our Buddhist community, um, mm -hmm. the community of those who simply call me and ask you know, questions about, you know, I appreciate when you pray at convocations that you remind and they involve all of us. Well, all of we are one, all of we are one. We have different mothers, different fathers, but when you look at what happened yesterday in America, never pretend you can be something you can't live. And if there were not the visionary people in 1864, uh, yesterday could have been even worse. Uh, we could still be in chattel slavery. We could still be second-class citizens and women. There's so many things that could be have happened that I think visionaries back then change. I'm so proud and so glad that race men and race women um, had the courage to stand up and declare, I am somebody. And you will know who I am by the legacy I leave. Another song I like is, may the works I've done yeah, speak for me. me. Amen? Amen. Hey, women. Hey, women. <laughs> yes. You know, Clarence, wait a minute. <laughs> My All right, Clarence. I'll see you at the, at the EA. Oh, and Sunday evenings, by the way, everyone, our chapel worship services are uh, broadcast every Sunday evening at 6 p.m. on WEAA 88.9. Uh, it is really an amazing, amazing program. Uh, takes a lot of hours to put together, uh, but thanks to Clarence and Ms. Price and all the people, we Thank get it done God. somehow, and um, to God be the glory. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alrighty. Can you give a link to those things so we can join? 
Yes, you just, uh, uh, EA, you just simply dial, uh, tune in your radio FM. Ah, okay. Sunday evening at 6 p.m. at 88.9. And the link that you got from uh, Mr. Lockman for this, feel free to send it out to any colleagues, friends, anywhere, and just tell them to become part of this experience. Um, I've got a, actually a, um, a, a, a text message the other day from Nova Scotia. Someone who was listening to the Sunday night program and really kind of oh. blew me oh. out the water, but um, it's, it's an amazing, amazing experience. And um, we're very humbled by it, but um, today's presentation is one of the most in-depth um, yeah, and just riveting experiences I've had uh, in my whole academic life. Um, there's a reason why um, God placed you here, brother, and you make such a difference. I wish our university could understand if we just could hold on to that vision there'll be no stopping what we could do to change this world. And truly, this world needs to be changed. Yesterday was as close as I've seen to outright insurrection in this world. Um, and for a moment, it what made me think about Alabama in the 1950s growing up. And um, had it not been for John Lewis and people like that, um, we may not even be here. So it's a lot to be thankful for. Warren? Um. This is a wonderful presentation, Professor Green. Thank you so very much. You know, and in these um, times that we are in, I was just reading a statement from 1884. Uh, you know, I'm always digging for stuff that uh, Morgan's, one of Morgan's early presidents, President Freisinger had to make on the, and this was made in 1884 uh, during the celebration of the centennial year of the Methodist Church. And as I recall, Morgan's uh, first name, the Centenary Biblical Institute, grew out of the fact uh, that it was named uh, for, you know, the centennial year, you know, of the Methodist Church. But as we look at HBCUs across the country and their presence, you know, I was thinking the other day, and then as I read this statement from President Friesen, you know, this impact, I won't read all of it, but one of the things he said about the founding of the Centenary Biblical Institute is this, the future of the colored race is largely involved in the success of this grand scheme. Mm. And as we look at the, elect the election of president-elect Kamala Harris, Howard University. As we look at my homeboy, uh, Representative James Clyburn, a graduate of South Carolina State University, Howard University. We have representatives in the Congress, uh, in uh, Representative Kwesi and Fumi. We must never underestimate the power of what these founders of our nation did. And now we have this great presence, you know, which shows exactly what President Freisinger was saying, that the grand scheme, not only does it, 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 it guarantee the success of the colored community, but the Constitution, I've often said, wouldn't be worth the ink it's written with mm -hmm. if it had not been for the sacrifices of Black Americans who have proved once again that democracy can work. This is so, sir. We must fight constantly to make it work. And, it's no, and we can see very clearly today that HBCUs, these people who founded these institutions, moral and intellectual elevation, at the key of that. So I don't want to preach. Oh, anything, yeah. That's all right, oh, yeah. Doug. It's all right. That's all right. That's all right. You know, theological reflection clearly says if you look through the Hebrew scriptures, God always leaves a remnant. And that remnant doesn't have names like Christianity or, or, or whatever it might be, it's in the people. And if a person has a vision, they are duty bound to share that vision. Uh, what good to do to, to spend your time in this journey, to leave this earth and never share your vision? Yeah. Um, I, my, my, my lifelong dream is to be that when I go, that I can say I left something uh, that may cl to clarify who it was that sent me and why I was here. 
Um, let me ask this question, uh, Professor Green. Are you available next Thursday? Let me let me check now. Once I think we may might want to continue this rather than you know put it off. I think that makes sense to. <laughs> oh yeah. And then each of us commit ourselves to bringing ten people on this, this broadcast. Yes. Yeah. Are you? Yes, I could do eleven on the fourteenth. Yeah. Well, that's what we're gonna do, Mr. Lockett. Wonderful. Wherever you are, we're doing <laughs> yes. part two next when next next Thursday. Okay. That's one of my, my dean decisions. Until next Thursday, looking forward to it. Um, and author, I love that shirt, brother. Yes. Yeah, it's really, you know, I admire the West kill. Africa. I just sort of saying, like, you know, that's festive. I like that. I was going to wear a bow tie like a Professor Green, but then I was like, you know what? Let me just bring some. <laughs> Some some uh, some some more. Some more Amen. Amen. The doctor Amen. kills. Yes, doctor, sir. Can I say? Can I say one thing? Sure. When, when I look yeah. at yeah, when I look at Morgan and walk across Morgan's campus, I see sacred ground. We, we have greats walking across Morgan's campus, even at the present, and also in the past. And when I say sacred ground, uh, I'm also thinking about Native Americans. Yes. yes. It's their land. Yes. So it's sacred not only for us, but basically from them. Yeah. So I, I would like for us to recognize them. And to what degree can we say something ab ab about sacred ground as it relates not only to African Americans, but to Native Americans, Dr. Green, next time? Yes. Well, it's yeah. interesting yeah. is uh, Dr. Kirchner and Mr. Howells uh, and Dr. Kills. And yeah. I have all participated and are participating on a major committee for the university and university uh, committee uh, for the globalization of the quad in particular, because yeah. the quad is, and again, this is why this part two is important and you'll see this actually in part two, uh, but nevertheless, um, the quad is the original tract of land um, that was acquired by Morgan. And it is the land that we have been able to trace to your point all the yes. way back to what is referred to as the Lumbee tribe, which was okay. an American all right. who Talk occupied that land. You're right, I know, right? We need part two, right? But nevertheless, oh, yeah. uh, maybe a three, <laughs> four, five. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but it is it's important uh, to, right. to recognize the fact that the original peoples, and that's why I say the original land, not the original land of ours but that the Native Americans had occupied that land in what we would call prehistoric. And oh, yeah. the Lumbee, L-U-M-B-E-E -E, tribe of the Native American peoples. And so we can bring it all the way forward because from there, the Welsh occupied that land, the Germans occupied that land. So it is very sacred and hollow before Africans and African-American. And so all embedded and embodied in the culture and the DNA of the Morgan Qua is a true globalization. When people think that they're driving by Cold Spring and Hillen or walking on the quad and it's just a black campus, it speaks to global history and culture. And so yes. again, a very great yes. question. And the part people's of the land. Memphis experience is that it really does highlight that kind of um, ethnic land. Uh, the Christmas Conference of 1784, uh, and even John Wesley, there was a lot of German experience. That's why you have Moravia Boulevard and places like that. So I think it's important to be able to go back to what was lifted up at the very beginning of Professor Green's presentation. That which has been lost, buried, obscured must be unearthed. Because once you know who where you are, you have a sense of celebratory pride that is enormous. Mm -hmm. um, we had as a student a few years ago, many of you may have known him, um, Malachi Hammond. I remember that name? He was a student from at Morgan, graduated maybe 2014. Well, he's a lumbly Indian from North Carolina. So when I go down to Fayetteville, I've gone down to to Lumbee and and to to look at that whole thing. So it's all. But again, if you don't Explore it, you don't know it. Yeah, <laughs> and that which you don't know invalidates who you are. That's why you have the craziness going on yesterday. Those people have no idea that, they, that this is a, a, a earth shared by many different wonderful people. Yes. And we must be able to lift that up. Next week, folks. Yes. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. All right. Thumbs up. <laughs> I'm gone. See y'all. 
God bless. All right. Reverend Keith, 